A reading from the book of Genesis. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, See, I am now establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that was with you, all the birds and the various tame and wild animals that were with you and came out of the ark. I will establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all bodily creatures be destroyed by the waters of a flood. There shall not be another flood to devastate the earth. God added, This is the sign that I am giving for all ages to come of the covenant between me and you and every living creature with you. I set my bow in the clouds to serve as a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow appears in the clouds, I will recall the covenant I have made between me and you and all living beings so that the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all mortal beings. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Your ways, O Lord, are love and truth to those who keep your covenant. Your ways, O Lord, are love and truth to those who keep your covenant. Your ways, O Lord, make known to me. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior. Your ways, O Lord, are love and truth to those who keep your covenant. Remember that your compassion, O Lord, and your love are from of old. In your kindness remember me because of your goodness, O Lord. Your ways, O Lord, are love and truth to those who keep your covenant. Good and upright is the Lord, thus he shows sinners the way. He guides the humble to justice, and He teaches His way to the humble. Your ways, O Lord, are love and truth to those who keep your covenant. A reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Beloved, Christ suffered for sins once, the righteous for the sake of the unrighteous, that He might lead you to God. Put to death in the flesh, He was brought to life in the Spirit. In it he also went to preach to the spirits in prison, who had once been disobedient, while God patiently waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few persons, eight in all, were saved through water. This prefigured baptism, which saves you now. It is not a removal of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers subject to Him. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. One does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. The Spirit drove Jesus out into the desert, and he remained in the desert for forty days, tempted by Satan. He was among wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. After John had been arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God. This is the time of fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, happy Lent to you once again, brothers and sisters, and it should be a happy season. You know, turning away from sin 
is a happy thing because it is sin that brings grief and devastation to our lives. But turning away from sin, embracing God more deeply, the source of all truth and goodness, beauty and life, well, of course, that's a happy thing. We purify ourselves in the process. We give up certain things to strengthen our renunciation of, of self, our renunciation of temptation, as Jesus himself did in the desert. And we say yes in a more profound, complete, and integral way to God in every thought and word and deed and decision and desire that we have. This is Lent, preparing us to celebrate the Paschal Mystery the death and resurrection of Christ with minds and hearts renewed. And Lent is a special time of preparation for those who will receive that beautiful sacrament that we read about in St. Peter's letter here in the second reading, baptism, by which we have all become sons and daughters of God, baptism that was prefigured by many events in the Old Testament, including the, the flood, Noah's Ark, and, and the flood that... Uh, cleansed the earth from sin. And this was, of course, the meaning of the, uh, of the flood, that God will not stand for sin. He wants to wash it away. And that, of course, prefigured how you and I were washed away from sin by our baptism. And uh, there are those now who are formally preparing the final phase of their preparation to be baptized because they were not baptized in the past or as infants. And these are called the catechumens of the church. Today there are special ceremonies in Catholic churches throughout the world whereby these men and women come forward and are, are chosen for, uh, for receiving baptism at Easter. We want to accompany them with prayer and joy during these final weeks of their preparation and welcome them into this Christian community that is founded on the very thing we heard in the gospel, Jesus Christ, who is the kingdom, proclaiming that it has come and that therefore we have to do two things, repent and believe. Jesus doesn't say the kingdom of God has come among you, therefore just come as you are and you don't have to change and believe whatever you want. No, he says the opposite. The kingdom of God is among you, therefore repent, renounce your sins, turn away from the evil that you do, and believe, not in your own ideas, believe in the gospel. Brothers and sisters, the flood shows that God takes action against sin. The waters of baptism for those who are preparing for it now, and for us who were baptized years ago, bring us that saving grace, that adoption as sons and daughters of God. And this, of course, is the gift. God wants to give all humanity in Jesus Christ. Now, here's an interesting question. God started humanity with the creation of Adam and Eve, he had to cleanse things when things got a little out of control, cleanse things with the flood. And then he gave Mo, uh, Noah and his family again the command that he had given to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. Made a covenant, not just with Noah and his family, but notice this covenant. There's various covenants that God made with his people. The covenant on Sinai through Moses was with the chosen people, but this covenant was with all people. All creatures, as a matter of fact, not just humans, all creatures on the earth. A covenant of love, a covenant saying, I will be your God, I will be your protector. So God started the human family, he made these covenants, but then Jesus Christ came at a specific point in history. Now if he came at a specific point in history, and he wants all people to embrace and enter the kingdom of God, repent and believe in the gospel, well they have to hear the gospel. If they want to follow Christ, well, Christ has to, to be there. So we all take advantage of that because we know the Gospels. We know what Jesus said. We have the sacraments. We have the church. We're able to take hold of him in faith and by baptism. But what about the people before him? If God wants all people to be saved and to come to know the truth, 
If Christ Jesus died for every sinner, if the kingdom of God is open to all humanity, if to be saved, furthermore, it is essential that we put our faith in Christ, and he said that that was essential, you must believe in the Son of Man, then how can those who came, who lived and who died before Jesus have the opportunity to do that? How can they have the opportunity to put their faith in the one and only Savior when that Savior had not yet come? Well, today we have that question answered for us by St. Peter. In the Creed, we say that Jesus died. He truly died. It wasn't just a mirage. It wasn't just that he fell asleep or went into some kind of trance. God made man truly shared our death. And you know, when we say the Apostles' Creed, we say he descended into hell. Now, that doesn't mean the hell of those who are condemned and will suffer eternal flames and eternal punishment because of their rejection of God and their failure to repent. It's not that hell, because those people can no longer be saved. They have definitively rejected God. So Jesus didn't go there. This hell is the translation of a word, Hades, that, uh, or Sheol, as we see in, in Hebrew, in the scriptures. It's a word that, remember, in the Jewish thinking, you know, Christ had not yet come, he had not yet fully revealed God's gift of eternal life. That became manifest in Jesus. So before that, our Jewish brothers and sisters of the Old Testament, uh, they had this shadowy notion of what happened after death. And people went to the abode of the dead, a shadowy place of a sort of a, a misty uh, existence. Uh, and, and, and this was Sheol, this was Hades. In fact, let me read for you, I get an indication of this in Psalm 88 where um, the psalmist is crying out, my couch is among, I am a man without strength. You know, Hades was like this place where people were just going around in this gray, shadowy, weak existence. I am a man without strength. My couch is among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave, whom you remember no longer and who are cut off from your care. The dark abyss um, and it goes on and say, will you work your wonders for the dead? Will the shades arise to give you thanks? So remember, a revelation is gradual. There was not yet the full, full revelation of eternal life in Christ Jesus. But the abode of the dead is what we're talking about in the creed when we say that Jesus went there. In one, in one sense, it's saying he truly died. Okay, so he he experienced our full human condition, life in the womb, childhood. He grew up as an adult. He experienced then truly our death. So he went among the abode of the dead. And Peter says here, when he went there, he preached. So, so take a step back and think of it this way. God loves everything he has created. The first reading made that clear, right? He made a covenant with all the creatures of the earth for all time. God loves everything he has made. And he wants us to be with him in salvation. But the only way to salvation is Christ. So Jesus' gospel, his invitation of salvation, his announcement of the kingdom of God, had to reach every human being that was ever created. That's what this is meant to convey that Jesus went down among the dead and he actually preached to the people who from Adam and Eve had been created but didn't have a chance to hear him proclaim his gospel. We do, even though he wasn't living in our times. He was 2,000 years ago. But we have that opportunity now looking back. And of course, he, as, a, as, as the living Christ, is still proclaiming his gospel through his church. But those who went before... They were now given the opportunity to do this. You know, there's a beautiful homily, an ancient homily from Holy Saturday. I want to read a little bit of it for you because it talks about this encounter of Jesus with the people who lived before he came. 
And this is how the homily starts. Something strange is happening. There is a great silence over all the earth, a great silence and stillness. The earth is still because the king is asleep. The earth was in terror and still because God is asleep in the flesh. And he has gone to raise up those who were sleeping from the ages. God has died in the flesh and hell trembles with fear. Truly he has gone to seek out our first parent like a lost sheep. He wishes to visit those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. He goes to free the prisoner Adam and his fellow prisoner Eve from their pains, he who is God and the son of Adam. The Lord goes to them, holding his victorious weapon, the cross. When Adam, the first created man, sees him, he strikes his breast in terror and calls out to all, My Lord be with you all. And Christ Jesus says in reply to Adam and with your spirit. And grasping his hand, he raises him up and says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give you light. I am your God, who for your sake became your son, and who for you and your descendants now speak and command with authority to those in prison, Come forth, and to those in darkness, have light, and to those who sleep, arise. Come, let us leave this place. He says to them. This is what Lent is about. This is what the glorious gospel of salvation is about. It's extended to every human being. And it is a call to repent. And a call to be washed in that water. That flood of grace. Which is baptism. And to know that the time of fulfillment has arrived. We need to look for no fuller truth about God or better way of life than we find in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us praise him that he has preached to us, to the people of his time, and to the people who came before. Let us praise him that we know the true Savior of the world and the one and only way of salvation. And let us praise him that we embrace all that that new life even more deeply now in this season of Lent and even more fully as we prepare to celebrate the greatest event of human history, the conquering of death by the resurrection of Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for this new life. Amen.